Uh, thanks for being here today, guys. I'd like to start out by thanking my advisors, Dr. Bachman and Dr. Freisinger, as well as contributing professors, Dr. Chen and Dr. Altai. Uh, without you guys, this project would not have been possible. So this project has a strong emphasis on uh, environmental sustainability. So I wanted to introduce you to the uh, underlying motivations for this project. So intergenerational ethics means meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, and the seventh generation principle says that we must consider the next seven generations when making decisions, especially in the context of our environment. JMU also has a perspective on sustainability. They say that to pursue sustainability is to create and maintain conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony that permit fulfilling the social and economic requirements of the present and future generations. And these three philosophies are really crucial for the longevity of our future generations. So I'm going to start with a little bit of climate change. Uh, the greenhouse effect is when radiation from the sun heats up the earth and excessive concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere acts like a blanket insulating um, our earth and this causes temperatures to rise. These are our four main culprits. Um, CO2 is the main one I'm going to focus on today because it is directly <coughs> tied to fossil fuel use and energy production and transportation. The United States is the second highest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world behind China. Uh, we produce 18% of the world's greenhouse gases, which is very disproportionate because we only make up 4% of the population. In terms of personal emissions, we're also second. So per person, we're the second most emitter, and that's behind Canada. Uh, we're much like Canada in development, but Canada has a more harsh climate than us, and that's what causes them to be higher. So real quick, by a show of hands, how many of you guys commute 30 minutes or more on a daily basis to work? And keep your hands up if you live in a standalone home that is over 2,000 square feet. You, my friends, are true Americans. <laughs> <laughs> You've worked hard for everything that you have, and you should be proud of that. But it's time to put the stereotypical American lifestyle under a microscope and see how that's affecting the well-being of our environment. Since we started tracking CO2 levels in our atmosphere, and that was in 1960, we've seen an increase of 20%. And this has caused a global temperatures to rise over a degree Celsius. And that might not seem like a lot, but it can have some devastating impacts on our environment, such as the melting of the ice caps. So we've seen their size decrease by 25% since the turn of the 20th century. And if projections, like you can see on the right, are accurate, we could see them dis almost completely disappear by the turn of the next century. Well, when um, ice caps melt, the ocean levels rise, and if theoretically all the ice caps and glaciers were to melt in the world, we could see a sea level rise of 230 feet. The United States is the seventh most at-risk nation in the world, and this is a serious threat to coastal infrastructure. We could see places like Florida, Norfolk, Manhattan, all at serious threats to uh, rising sea levels. And there are a lot of sources of CO2. We aren't the only ones. Not our, our personal lives don't control you know, all of the CO2 in the world. Industry, for example, is a huge uh, polluter of CO2, or emitter of CO2. Um, but we can control our personal footprint. It's how we live, it's how we drive, and I'm going to show you how the history of our development has really influenced this. So currently, 43% of the American population lives in a standalone house, over 2,000 square feet, but it wasn't always that way. So at the turn of the 20th century, this is your typical home, it's an apartment building, and over four people would live in an apartment size of 1,300 square feet. Um, and then in the 1920s, suburbia started to form, and this is because uh, automobiles became very affordable and people wanted to move away from those urban centers. But then the Great Depression really brought this to a halt. This is the common uh, Hoover Town, as they would call it. Uh, it's kind of just a slummy, you know, people didn't really have a whole lot of money at the time. But the Second World War uh, filled Americans' pockets because of rationing. And after the war, people wanted to move away from the urban centers, and they started having a lot of kids during the baby boom, and so we had suburbia pop up again. This is Levittown. And the trend continues today. Uh, house size has grown over 2,000 square feet, yet our family size has shrunk to only about just over two and a half people. Now I'm going to show you two typical house layouts and how they affect our, and how they can have impacts on our environment. So right here is two houses in Richmond. The one on the left being a row house in the, the fan district in downtown Richmond. Um, this represents a low maintenance life. Because many of these are at these residents' fingertips, they don't have to go far for anything. 
This house is also brick and it's built to last. And I, I ask you to check out the fact that the middle row house, uh, its, its faces are only exposed to ambient air on the front, top, and back. And this makes it an efficiently heated house. Now the house on the right, this represents a high maintenance life. You can just ask my dad. He's so sick of mowing the lawn, he doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> um, also notice that it's a stick and frame uh, construction with vinyl siding, and all of its walls are exposed to the ambient air. And this makes it a very poorly efficient, poor, it's an inefficiently heated house. And the car garage speaks to the American auto-centric culture, so these people are going to drive wherever they need to go, where, wherever they need to get, um, whenever they need to get something. So moving forward, I'm going to show how these house layouts can really affect the environment through a thermodynamic analysis. So I started out with a very simple model. Model one is a 1,800-square-foot um, house, vinyl-sided, no windows. I wanted to get used to the modeling software and the calculations at the time, so I kept it very simple. Model two is a standalone with windows, two on each side. Model three, I kept it consistent, so I have no windows on this one. It's a four-unit row house. Each are 1,800 square feet. I want to be able to compare it to model one. And then model four is, it has the windows, so I can compare it to model two. Uh, the th three types of heat transfer that I'm going to discuss, I'm going to give you some examples to make them easier to understand, because they are complex um, concepts. So we have conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is heat loss and gain through contact. So imagine how your, heat, your um, pan or pot or pan heats up when you put it on an electric burner. That's, that's conduction. Convection is best exemplified when you blow on hot soup or on coffee to cool it down. And radiation is when, for example, on like a 90 degree day, you know how much cooler it is in the shade? Well, when you step out into the sun, you can feel that heat on your skin. That's radiation. So this is the formula that I use for conduction and convection. Uh, Dr. Chen showed me that I could use this U variable to calculate not only the, the R values that relate to conduction and the insulation factor for the house, but I could also determine the, the, loss, the conductive, convective losses via conduction using this variable. Uh, this is the formula for radiation. Um, some of the variables I want to speak about, so the delta T, for example, is the change in temperature between the inside of the house and the outside of the house. And I made some assumptions when determining these, these variables. Um, I wanted to keep a, a consistent external conditions between all the houses, so I use the uh, Virginia climate and the average yearly temperature for the outside, which is 53 degrees, and for the inside I use your standard uh, room temperature, 69. Um, the main variable that I wanted to bring your attention to is the A variable. This is surface area. So because the walls are touching for the row houses, it's going to have considerably less surface area, and in theory, it's going to be more... Um, thermodynamically efficient. And that's actually what I found. So the blue bars here are my row houses and uh, the amount of energy that they consume, and the red are my standalone. And when I crunched the numbers, I found that there was an over 30% reduction in heat loss just because of layout alone. To validate this, I went to the National Renewable, Renewable Energy Laboratory's BIOT um, software. Again, I made the houses 1,800 square feet to keep it simple to see if I could validate my hand calculations. Um, these are the inputs, and I'd like to bring your attention to these over here. So Dr. Chen actually helped me determine what these should be so I could com best compare my hand calculations to the uh, software modeling. And I wasn't really very experienced with it, so I, he actually helped me determine all these complex variables. And then the ones I really wanted to show you are these. So the location of this house is in Virginia, so that I can have all the external conditions be the same as my hand calculations. And down here, circled below, is the carbon factor. This is going to allow me to determine how much CO2 is emitted per uh, energy consumed. And these are my outputs. So it might be a little uh, hard to understand, but this is essentially my standalone house output, and this is my row house. And I found that the only considerable difference between the two in their energy consumption was in their, their heating values, which is no surprise because of their layouts. I found that there was over a 50 or a 50% average reduction in their heating requirements because of the layout. So it might not seem like the difference between 30 for my hand calculation, 30% more efficient, and 50% average more efficient for these makes sense and validates my hand calculations. But notice that the BOP software did not allow me to make the roof lines the same. This makes a discrepancy in the uh, surface area which is ultimately the factor that makes this a wider margin of savings than the hand calculations. In terms of CO2, because the heating was 50% more efficient, 
I also found that there was a 50% reduction in CO2 for just for the heating value. So now I'm going to move into some transportation requirements for a suburban um, environment. And I'm using the same locations as before. And I made my job location in downtown Richmond, I made it uh, the Federal Reserve. And I used the car that I use now, and I calculated over 10 years seven different factors. Their distance, fuel consumption, fuel cost, time, CO2 emissions, and maintenance. I found over 10 years you can save over $8,000 having the shorter commute, just in, f in fuel cost and maintenance. I also found that you could emit 60,000 less tons of CO2 across this time. If you valued your time in terms of money, uh, at $25 an hour, you could save over $30,000. These are tremendous savings. And so I just wanted to put this in perspective of a combination. So an urban environment with a short commute, short, uh, uh, lower transportation requirements, you could see $41,000, over $41,000 saved over 10 years if you lived in this environment. And you could reduce your CO2 emissions by over 30 tons. This is over a 10 year period. <clears throat> I wanted to understand why Americans desired such an unsustainable life. So I took a look at 15 different websites and I typed in what are the most desirable uh, house features. I, fa I then applied a, a, s a score of 100 to the first response on the website, and I went down by 10 until I got to the 10th response, and that value got a, 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 t a score of 10. So I went down by 10 every time. And these were my results. Pretty, uh, pretty standard results. Size, kitchen, layout, bed, bath, these are, this is nothing new. But notice that energy efficiency isn't even on the top 10. When I started this project, I wanted to just design an awesome house. I was thinking, I was thinking like the normal American. I wanted to design an awesome house. It was going to have tennis courts, a swimming pool, <laughs> you know, an indoor theater. It was going to be awesome. I just wanted to get better at uh, modeling software. And and Dr. Bachman said, "Mead, we have to check out our eyesight habits of mind and really consider sustainability." And so I did. And I realized it's not just about one house. It's about giving the a greater American population, something that they can all adopt and all live by. And it's about the lifestyle and culture. This is a very complex problem with a lot of stakeholders beyond the home buyer. Two being the um, land use planners and the home builders. And they feed into this, this uh, culture. And they're very, they, they, have, they have a lot of responsibility in terms of how our land is used. So I wanted to see, you know, what do these land planners actually typically pass as the standard? So I found this, and this is residential Harrisonburg and commercial Harrisonburg. And you can see um, if, a, if a developer was to come to a land planner and say, hey, I want to put these two in Harrisonburg and these plots of land, they wouldn't even blink an eye because it's what we're used to. It's, what we're, it's the standard. And this is a very energy intensive life. I want to bring your attention to the fact that there aren't even sidewalks over here. People are going to hop in their car to drive to Harrison, to, to drive to Walmart, and everybody knows how terrible Walmart is. This is like a two football field sized parking lot. We need to urge our local officials and land planners to move away from this reckless model of development. So where might we find you know, a better model for development? Well, I look towards Europe, and European cities have been built to last. They've been highly successful at utilizing this plaza style development to lower their transportation requirements. The United States population is projected to grow by 20% by 2050. So it's time to start developing sustainably. Changes in development could create a domino effect. A personal push for sustainability could translate into an upward push on the corporate and government levels, as well as groom our future generations to demand a sustainable life. So this is the overview of what I designed. This is the macro scale. Um, I wanted to point out that it's flexible in application. I really like the shape because it can really like mix and move around and it, can, and it can connect easily. And the green space can be used for any amenities, any amenities that we need. Uh, effective zoning is really important for my project because this puts um, amenities at people's fingertips and it reduces their transportation requirements. So my design criteria was I wanted it to be pedestrian friendly, high density and spacious because that's what Americans want. They want, spe they want size, they want space. And, energy, and have energy efficient housing. So where can we find a live, work, play model? Well, look no further, you're here. <laughs> JMU has a ton of food locations, athletic facilities, and houses over 5,000 students on campus. So I took a look at East Campus, where we are right now, to see how this dynamic plays out. I have the residents in yellow, 
the food, which is the second half of the live dynamic in blue, uh, academic facilities where we work in red, and uh, leisure and athletic facilities in white. And look how well integrated these are. Residents have such easy access to everything they need. But unfortunately, our autocentric lifestyle clashes with this live work play dynamic. And um, I just urge you to think back to freshman year about how low maintenance your life was. It was incredible. I'd walk out of my dorm at Eagle Hall and I'd go to D Hall first. And then I'd go to ISAT for my classes, and then I'd go to the gym, and then I'd go home, and I walked everywhere, and I didn't have any you know, maintenance or responsibilities. I found a lot of freedom when I moved off campus, but with freedom comes responsibility. And now I sit in traffic on port in that labyrinth of stoplights. Uh, I take trips to Walmart, it's such a hassle. Um, and so I wanted to see beyond academia where I could find some live work play models and so I found rest in Virginia. Rest in Virginia was widely considered America's first planned city and Robert Simon founded it in 1964 and it has the potential to employ 85 percent of its residents. It has a great mix of housing and this allows people of all socioeconomic backgrounds to live here. In terms of recreation it has everything that the standard American would want and it includes a European style plaza right here where people can walk around and uh, enjoy the retail opportunities and, and fine dining and everything like that. Reston's also done a great job of transportation. Um, there is a metro connection that's going to be completed by 2020 that will take thousands of commuters off the road daily. So I wanted to see some other places that also were desirable and see what make them tick. And so according to Business Insider with the criteria being job market value, quality of life, desirability, and net migration, these were the top 10. These places are going to be, are inherently going to be, uh, have a lower energy use than suburbia. And it's because of places like this that makes them desirable. Places where people can come together, culture can flourish, social interactions, a lot of social interactions. Um, so the downtown mall in Charlottesville is a great spot to spend an afternoon. People get together and look how busy it is. Uh, Carytown, my hometown, Richmond, this is personally one of my favorite spots in Richmond. Uh, several times a year they'll block off the one-way street and right here you actually see people celebrating the watermelon festival. A watermelon festival, right? <laughs> so I wanted to bring these design features into my, into my uh, Google SketchUp design. And this is what I produced. So this is the main residential unit of my design. Um, I wanted to stay away from the standalone house and go more towards the row house because the standalone house is so energy intensive. And I want to stay away from renewable resources because oftentimes they're costly and unaesthetically pleasing for the consumer. So these are over 2,000 square feet, including a finished basement. Uh, they also have a front porch, and I don't know if you can see it right here, but a rear patio, patio balcony so that you can you know, have that little outdoor space that you can you know, enjoy for yourself. Um, also in the community is a, a mixed use apartment. So at the bottom of the apartment right here, are two commercial units, and above you have four residential units, over 1,800 square feet each. They also have a balcony um, on each of the residential units, and on the side of the um, commercial building, mixed-use building, is this um, patio, and on top is this green roof. I did include a little bit of green space for each, um, each neighborhood, so sandwiched between the row houses and the uh, apartment building is this little shared yard where people can you know, stretch their legs gives them a sense of their normal backyard. Um, in terms of commercial space, I wanted to provide the residents with a lot of employment opportunities. So there's three different types of commercial spaces. The one on the left being um, the centralized plaza downtown, sort of like the, the urban center type um, commercial space. And I see this being more of a restaurant or a bar. Um, the neighborhood corner, I see that being something like a gym or a grocery store that needs more space. And the one on the far right, this is below residence, so I wanted to make this a, you know, more low-key place. So I made this, I, I see this being more of a small business or retail-oriented space. And this is my community overview. So one thing I wanted to point out is how these neighborhoods individually are shaped like triangles. And I really like this shape because it allowed me to stack them up and make them really high density. But provide the residents with all this space where amenities could be flexible. And this is something that suburbia just wouldn't be able to access. Amenities include tennis courts, because everybody knows tennis is a lifelong sport. Uh, the park is the, the community's main green space. Um, the centralized plaza is sandwiched between four commercial units, and it has a stage where you can have 
you know, local bands and theater performances. And then last, we have the community basketball court and the playground of Splash Show. And this is a great place where the youngest of our community can make memories and socially engage. And I really wanted to include something of all age, uh, for all ages and stages so everybody could enjoy this community. But obviously, the you know, use, use of the space is flexible. I wanted to bring you back to this. The reason that uh, a more live, work, play, high density lifestyle is so much more efficient than the suburban lifestyle we currently enjoy. Originally I said you'd save over $41,000 and reduce your CO2 emissions by 30 tons. But as we saw, my project became less of a personal expenditure and more of a community model. So I calculated a, a typical you know, development. And for 10,000 homes over 170 year, over 70 year lifespan, we could save over $400 million. And emit three, over 300,000 less tons of CO2. Imagine a shift from suburbia to a live work play atmosphere across the United States. Imagine not just its immediate impact, but the impact it would have over seven generations. Imagine not just what that impact would have for us, but for our children, our children's children, and our children's 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 children. So it's time to do what is right. It's time to follow in Reston's footsteps, and it's time to be the change. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the ISAT faculty. They've you know really changed me over the past four years for the better. You all have done an incredible job. Uh, to JMU, thank you so much for providing me with an incredible experience. It, I wouldn't change a thing. And to my family, thanks for, all, for always having my back and uh, for my friends for always keeping it lighthearted and have a good time. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'll take questions now. What up, Will? Um, so I wanted to say the presentation was awesome. I love the PowerPoint layout. I thought it was beautifully done and really engaging. Uh, but my question is, where would you want to put this community? Like, if you could place a community, where do you think a good placement for it would be? That's really hard to say. Um, honestly, it's hard with so much infrastructure that we already have. But places where you could see populations moving, like Harrisonburg, would be a great option. Um, I noticed that they started expanding out towards Rockingham County and that area where they've built that mini Walmart. And then you can see way across a wide road, a four lane road, they built residence. Why wouldn't they just integrate it with, you know, a better mixed use commercial and residential space? It would have been incredible. Awesome presentation. Um, I had a question. So would you provide incentives to people that want to live in a suburban area to move into this kind of more urban, close-knit place? That's a good question. Um, I tried to make it as spacious as possible to kind of simulate the, ur the suburban environment. And I realized I, it, it, it looks very cramped. And it would take a little bit of an adjustment period to end up in an environment like the one I, des I designed. But I kind of figured that it would be a very attractive place to live because of all the amenities that are at people's fingertips. So I feel like it wouldn't necessarily be a financial in incentive, mm -hmm. but obviously they would save, you know, personally on their, you know, emissions, transportation. It'd be a very low maintenance life, and it'd, it'd be, I think, would be an easy transition for most Americans. Great presentation. Thank you. So I have a comment and a question, so okay. I apologize in advance for doing that. Um, <laughs> first off, I would say great presentation. It's awesome to see some numbers put behind some of the stuff that the faculty has been saying for years and that I've agreed with that sustainable work-life play models are great. That being said, one of the things that I would invite you to consider if you were to build off of this model is to look into some of the aesthetically pleasing breakthroughs in passive slash sustainable energy. One of the things uh -huh. that I like are the Tesla shingles. Those are awesome. Right, yeah, so it's one of those things you could plug it into this model. You could probably see even more impressive numbers than what you've already come up with. Absolutely, and I wanted to consider renewables at first, and I looked at Tesla's roof tiles, yeah. but they're just not there quite yet. So I'm okay. kind of considering a current state sort of model. But yeah, in the future, those would be incredible. Okay. So then my question is, um, you did a great job with passive energy savings, but did you look into more active energy saving 
technologies like smart home? Uh, I didn't do a whole lot of that with smart home, but if these were built, you know, within the next five years, you could assume that you, they could easily connect to your smart devices and things like that. I didn't really fully design the insides. I just wanted to show, you know, a concept type bro round, bro home that could save energy yet be attractive to the American consumer. Sure. Cool. Exactly. Thank you for your questions. All right. Sure. Thank you, Mead. I'm sorry, guys. We have to move on to the next one, which starts at 9:30. Thanks for coming. Thanks for a great presentation, Mead.